What's up, YouTube? You see the title. Sunil Gulati, a member of the FIFA Executive Council, CONCACAF Council, and former U.S. Soccer President, joins us today on Extra Time. Skip ahead to the 31st minute to hear this incredible interview talking about what it's like to be an American at FIFA after all those investigations, how we got the 2026 World Cup, and what went down in 1994 that sprang the sport forward. But don't skip ahead, because before that, we've got great stuff. Is the best player in the Premier League era, David Silva, coming to Major League Soccer? And the, Miami. And the potential future of MLS and Liga MX and the playoff that would blow your mind. Interleague 2. Um, how about a golden boot race, baby? How about it? Extra time starts now. Ah, uh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental from the AT&T MLS Studios in Midtown Manhattan. I am Andrew Wiebe with my partners in soccer, Bobby Warshaw, David Goss, Susanna Collins. What's up? You're an inspiration, Bobby. You get me going. Sometimes <laughs> these pipes just, you know, they sputter a bit. But when I look over and see you mocking slash imitating slash paying, also be looking respect. Mechanicsburg head to yes, he does. Have you? He might be a mechanic. You look like and you're I say about that to with no hunting. disrespect at all. What? Look at <laughs> that. Look like I'm about to go duck hunting. Yeah, you've got your Henley on. You've got your like <laughs> metallic -y hat. Metallic's not the word. I mean, no, it was denim. No. Yeah, looks like it's been yeah. worn a lot in the outdoors. Let's just say that. Did you get that hat the day you entered Major League Soccer? I did. I did. Yes, that's exactly what they do. They hand you a jersey and, and a hat. And a hat. And I've just kept that hat forever. I say, welcome to the league. Well, that I would believe because athletes love nothing more than free stuff. That's Everybody like, loves almost free to stuff. an extent Who more. Like free but they stuff. get free. They literally they, they get jerseys stuff. that they play in. They get warm up gear. They get all the stuff, and then they're like, "Hey, can I get like a jacket?" And you're like. You, who makes hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars and get all this free stuff, that's what you need is a sweatshirt? Okay. By the way, I do have a Columbus Crew jersey on right now that I also got for free, but I'm rocking it right now because October 10th, they're breaking ground on that stadium in downtown Columbus, and that is awesome news for everybody who fought to save the crew and now see this bright future for that club. We have a big show coming up, Suno Galati. He will join us at the back end of this show. It's about a 30-minute interview going over his entire career in U.S. soccer, how he fell in love with the game, how he got involved as a volunteer back in the 80s, how he rose up the masthead to be what we know him as, which is U.S. soccer president for more than a decade on the FIFA Council, on the CONCACAF Council. Uh, you'll want to stick around yeah, for that interview. Let's give the good sell. Talks about the future of NWSL. Talks about what it's like to be a member of FIFA. And the good days and the bad days. Mm -hmm. Ooh. And uh, the state of the U.S. men's national team and whether yeah, he yeah. has quote-unquote hope. Want. So, yeah, thank you for doing that. Also, some programming news here. We also chatted with Abby Wambach. Both of these two, Sunil and Abby, are going into the National Soccer Hall of Fame on Saturday in Frisco. So, Abby was... A great interview as well, but if we included both in this show, we literally would not get to talk about soccer at all, so we didn't. Friday, a special with Abby Wambach coming out. You want to give the sell on that one, or should I do so? You can do that. I will do so. Uh, so this one is her entire career, her favorite goal, the lawsuit that the women are currently embroiled in with U.S. soccer, the fight for equal pay, what the World Cup meant this summer, how she's sipping tea, obviously – and uh, what her future holds and what she wants everyone out there to know about uh, the future of NWSL and how maybe, just maybe, partnerships with MLS are the way to go forward with that one. The key word there, investment. Oh, on that note, if you are a Red Bull or a DC fan, September 29th, the week before Decision Day, there's an MLS game, double header with Sky Blue facing Orlando Pride, so you can get to Red Bull Arena. I'm going to do that and watch two soccer games. Double That's soccer. That is the dream. Yeah. In the fall, in beautiful oh, Red Bull Arena, mm. I'm going to bring my own apple cider. I hope they let it in. <laughs> they will not let that in. They you already know in. that. All right, let's talk about that. soccer. Jesse Marsh is a man we know well. I've spoke to on this show many times, and now he's head coach of Red Bull Salzburg. They got a big 6-2 win in the UEFA Champions League against Genk. He's the first American to coach in the competition. He got a big win. We just won a fist pump for Jesse. Anybody else going to fist pump, or am I just going to say fist pump? Okay. Fine. What's I it was mean? With you. Yeah. Okay. This side of the table, cool. <laughs> this side of the table, aloof and too cool for school. I'm I'm on record for not doing Andrew Weeby bits. You've done a lot of them, so actually you're Ooh, on record going the other way. Interesting that his record has changed from I don't do bits to I don't do Andrew Weeby. So bits. it's open. Ooh, yeah. Admitting so uh -huh. the bits. After he, he's been doing bits for nine months. After further investigation, yes, it's truly only Weeby bits. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Those are the ones I go on strike for. Yeah. Uh, what's it mean to you, Bobby? Jesse Marsh doing this. 
I also, well, you can't talk about that unless you reference Tenorio's piece for The Athletic, right? Because they Good go point. hand in hand because his success is about how he goes about his coaching. And the big thing for Jesse Marsett, I take away is his attention to leadership and man management, right? We talk about the tactics, we talk about pressing and geek and pressing and the pace they play at, but also every player that's ever played for him talks about how they feel so empowered. They feel like they're at the height of their powers, that they feel confidence. And that is intentional from Jesse and how he goes about his leadership and working with individuals. And it's something we probably don't talk about enough. We love to talk about tactics and strategy, but Jesse is just so focused on how you work with other human beings. My favorite part of that piece was when he talked about how he deals with the 17 other guys who aren't getting the start and how that's where he puts his attention because he keeps telling these guys you're going to have your moment because you know these are guys that want to play they want to be out there contributing and the attention that he gives to the guys who might not necessarily be getting the call on game day but being like listen I believe in you believe in yourself your moment is coming like I it having been one of gave those me all the feels <laughs> having been one of those 17 more often than I would have liked he is very right. Yeah. Our feelings do matter. They do matter. And I had a long conversation with Kaylin Carr earlier today, and I said, hey, look, we really respect you as a contributor <laughs> to Extra Time. Today your moment, is not your day. There is a new movement out, though, so Kaylin will appreciate that plug. By the way, Liverpool, Anfield up next for Jesse Marsh and Rebel Salzburg. Should they take it easy on our boy, or how press should on, they handle press that? Press on, press on, press on. Yeah. Kill him. Kill, Kill him. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Okay. Sweep the leg. No, I, no, no, no. No, 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 no. Okay. No. Sorry, Jesse. Yeah. <laughs> Love you, but yeah. no. Go to the north of England and prove it. Come right? on, Jurgen. Can you do it on a midweek day in Liverpool with the rain falling around you? Uh, speaking of Champions League, David Silva is the latest to be linked with Inter Miami, and I promise everyone out there we will get to Wednesday night games as well. The Independent says he's coming. The 33-year-old will uh, arrive after EPL season, so next summer. Yeah? Good? Very good. I'll, I'll take the pro side. I think this is a very good, the best player in the English Premier League in the last 10 years. Maybe the 10 years before that, it was Thierry Henry. Since David Silva got there, since the rise of Manchester City, Silva has been the best player, and people will point to his age, and I'll say he is still a key figure and starter in one of the two best teams in England, if not Europe. So don't focus on the age. He's still got it. He still has a skill set that translates to getting a little bit older. I love the signing. I'm excited to see him on a regular pace, basis. Chance creation. That's what I think of. And mm -hmm. he's not like your traditional, okay, Golazos, final pass through balls. But I think of like a, I don't know, maybe, I don't know why. He does Maxi all of it. Maxi Morales is what jumps to mind for me as a guy who's just going to be like an elevator of everything around him. All of a sudden, everything everybody else does just jumps up a level in speed, in thought, in clarity, in the cleanliness on the ball. I mean, he's just that sort of player. Yeah, he's also better. Yeah, yeah no, that, that, so. that, that was the, yeah, that was the that's why I hesitated yeah. with Maxi Morales. Didn't want to disrespect <laughs> no, not at all. Didn't want to disrespect David. Yeah, but he's better. Yeah, and obviously he, he's probably more goal dangerous as well. He can hit it from distance. He will play that final ball. He will be the piece you can play through. And when you look for already with Inter Miami, one, he's a famous personality as someone that everyone loves to be around, like at that elite level of players. Everyone's friends with him. Um, they did the Amazon Prime piece about, you know, Man City, and you saw how much the club cared about him. And, you know, he's down to earth, and he, he's close to his family and all that stuff. So it's things that people can latch on to. It makes it easier to sign that second DP, whoever it's going to be, because everyone wants to play with David Silva. Yeah. And he knows everyone. He's got personal relationships with everyone. On top of that, his ability, like you said, will elevate everyone. So now you're doubling down on the young players you've brought in Carranza and Pellegrini from South America and saying, like, these guys produce at this level. We can sell them for more. So the money you're putting into Silva comes back through what you're selling them for because they're finishing off the chances he creates. So on top of that, I, I think the biggest comparison could be David Villa. You know, he's not outspoken. He's not going to be the face of a franchise like Zlatan was, maybe even like what Joseph is because he doesn't have that style and swagger that Joseph has. But I think he's more entertaining to watch on the field. He's more fun. There's more highlight reel stuff that will come from the way he plays. And I'm pretty sure he would dominate for a little while. Yeah, I think so too. Quiet leadership. <laughs> let's play this game, Susanna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know you're open to bits. It's not really a bit, I guess. <laughs> uh, let's play predict the next Inter-Miami transfer link. Oh, God. We've had Griezmann. We've had Cavani. We've had yeah. uh, Messi, which I think still feels pretty real in this scenario. 
We've had it's got to be Bale. sexy. It's Miami, you yeah. know? Like, so this has got, you know, when I'm thinking of like a DP coming to play for Inter Miami, like there's yeah. got to be some serious, you people right? Like I'm up. thinking like a James Rodriguez, oh. you know, like something, I don't know. Like, <laughs> but a it's a really good shout. It's yeah. got to be, it's got to be a real sexy, sexy name. Uh-huh. That's, Sergio Aguero yeah. could be a guy like that. Yeah. You uh, kind of like blinked at me in an annoyed way, Bobby. No, it's a, no, it's a, it's a fair shout. It hadn't occurred to me, but I'll give it to you. It it's would be a bad. lot of risk <laughs> on a guy who's struggled with injuries. I would say, in that vein, and probably less sexy, but just as successful, would be Iguain. Mm. At some point, he's on the outs at Juve. I don't know that you know a lot of clubs are going to want to build around him. But if you already have Silva in, mm, 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 then you need a goal mm, scorer. I, mm, we got all of this wrong. It's Kareem Benzema. It's Kareem Benzema. I, but but you guys are naming ones that have already happened. Oh, he already happened? Kareem Benzema drives around Miami with the production well, team yeah. and puts up videos <laughs> where he's like, this is my city. But there wasn't an official <laughs> link. All the right? official link was on Extra Time Radio when we said Kareem Benzema is probably going to go. Nice, you, nice. You know who my top, top, top target is? Sure. In the Jovin- Jovinko mold? What about Dabala? I thought you were going to say mine that I said to you yesterday. I was going to be so upset. Oh. No, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't pull a weebie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nice. Oh, Jeez. Uh, no, but Dabala. D- there's he's no not, way. He's, there's no not? way at his we, age. Yeah, that's what we said about Jovinko. No, that's not what we said. We didn't even think about Jovinko. Isn't Dabala four even, years younger It didn't even cross Jovinko our minds. Was? Yeah, well, there's got to be a next trend. Jovinko comes at 27, 28. Yeah. Okay, how about this? How about Jack Rodwell? Nah, I'm just kidding. But so by the way, apparently the one, he's with the Revs right now, trialing. The one I said to him yesterday when we were watching Champions League was Shakiri, who is a Jovinko, oh, yeah. which is yeah. can't break into a starting team, yeah. but is a starter in a World Cup and good. Clearly could be a stud for an MLS team that said, hey, we want you to be the guy. Come mm-hmm. somewhere you could be the I guy. I could see that. Uh, whoever comes to Inter Miami is more than likely, I, I would go ahead and guarantee it, going to play in League's Cup very, very soon because Ooh. it expands the 16 teams in 2020. And Enrique Bonilla, the League MX president, is basically saying that 2021 or 2022 – goes from 16 then maybe to 32 teams so like close to everybody playing in this thing i am on record saying i'm a fan of league's cup it's only going to get bigger and better and more fun bonia is on record saying that mls teams will quote have to see the tournament in a different way now that they realize that we sent the best we have they got to realize that they have to send the best they have we didn't this year major league soccer Mm -hmm. period and that's why there was not an mls team in the final cruz azul won that final in las vegas uh, on wednesday night it was feisty. Like, oh, what does this thing mean? I don't know. But like Gignac and Yoshi Yotun and Paul Da Silva, they've got their own ideas about what it means. And it meant everything to these players. Someone got taken off in an ambulance. And like where there was red cards, Nahu got a red card. It was all over the place. But it showed at least when these teams face off on a field, like they care. It matters. Because they want to beat each other every single time. And in the MLS point of view, for CCL, it matters to win CCL and go to the Club World Cup. But it also matters to say we're better than these Liga MX teams or we're just as good, whatever. And I think that's what Bonilla is saying. Like, we've given you a second avenue to prove that. This isn't just a throwaway game. If you send your best and play, you will have an opportunity to say, yes, we as RSL defeated Tigres. You don't have to say in the League's Cup or in CCL, like, yeah. it is just as valuable to have beaten them whatever a tournament you do it in. And the flip side of that is if you sin that weekish. We will yeah. spike you. We will spike you. Like, that. that's what they will do. But, well, MLS uh, teams did not get spiked. No, they didn't. But they didn't even come close to making the final, and ultimately that's the deal. Next year, I think, different story. More teams. I'm excited for it. But there was a nice little nugget from Tom Marshall at ESPN FC, and we love his work. You should follow him on Twitter uh, as well as anything that he does out there. And he said, according to his sources and reporting, that Liga MX and MLS are thinking about interleague play. We've talked a lot on this show about how there might be a combined league. Mm -hmm. So interleague plays, that's the first time I've heard that sort of phrasing. And you know it from Major League Baseball where National League, American League, you have a couple games a year where you come together. It took 90 years of the existence of professional baseball for this to happen. And they finally did, and it was a huge, huge hit. What do you think about interleague? Because I love the idea. Give me, like, four games a year that count in the standings where you don't have to combine leagues and mess with the caps and the way that you move players around. You just say, you know what? There are 12 points on the line or whatever it is. Come together. Fight it out. It matters. It goes in the standings. By the way, you got to come to Mexico, too. Yeah. And Bonilla says that's hopefully going to happen in League's Cup, which is a huge, huge upgrade. Yeah, I think it, I hadn't thought of it in this way that – League MX and MLS teams could play against each other 
and you could just count them for their standings in their current leagues without having to pull them out and say, well, we have a playoff game, uh, you know, a, a big game either weekend. We can't value this, blah, blah, blah. This is actually a really good way to do it. You say, you know, four MLS teams play four the same. It's basically like the NFL, right? You play the same conference. So it's equal to saying, like, well, Minnesota had to play the same Morelia and Cruz Azul like the same team, so it's somewhat fair. And look, it's not with expansion, it's not going to be equal for Supporters Shield anyway. Like you're not there's no home and home. Yeah. Regardless. So there's always going to be some imbalance. What do you think, Suzanne? I see I'm you here sort for of it. like mm, okay. No, no, I love it. I love it. And I love um the fact that, you know, they came out and said that like the the tournament this year uh, basically kind of lit a fire under MLS teams. And I, I think that especially with, you know, we think about like World Cup 2026, uh, 2026 coming up and like the sort of union uh, unionization of, of North American soccer and getting these these two leagues to kind of come together. It's symbolic. It's cool. Like I want to see these teams play against each other and if we want to be if MLS wants to be considered one of the best teams or best leagues in the world you got to play against the best and right now Mexico is that right now so let's let's can, do it can I give you my full pitch oh, on this Andrew go for my it, Bobby. full You're, idea here how about your let's go we calling this gal, uh, Bobby's galaxy brain league MX MLS I'm excited combo. For this. I think there's a lot of listeners out there that are just like that's standard okay <laughs> but for this okay major league soccer consider it the American League Okay. Liga MX, consider it the National League. American League and National League in baseball don't play each other regu regularly, only in interleague play. They come together in the playoffs. So you would have Major League Soccer play its 34 game schedule. There would be a Supporter Shield winner. The playoffs would, in essence, be the League's Cup. The number one seed from Major League Soccer plays the number four seed or eight seed from Liga MX, their bottom playoff making seed. And then you do a full playoff system. So you might have two Liga MX teams in the final, the Campeones to like Campeones or whatever you want to call Conference, it. MLS team. Correct. <laughs> you might have two MLS, but you have a true supporter shield. That is the true MLS champion, no questions about it. And then you have a playoff champion, which is the champion of champions or however it would be titled at the end of it. So it is in essence a combined league minus the restrictions on travel or budgeting because the supporter shield would still have the same, if not increased weight for having been the MLS champion. So within MLS, winning the Supporter Shield would make you the MLS champion. That's... Yes. That's, okay. Yes. There would be no MLS Cup, quote-unquote. Got, quote. Got it. Okay. The playoff I don't hate that. I don't hate it either. Yeah, MLS Cup would be the final at the end, which is essentially what Campeones to Campeones is in a slightly different version, mm -hmm. but there would still be a playoff and a playoff cup. Mm -hmm. You know what I kind of like? I almost like going to the Liga MX split season, and you have two playoffs a year like that. So it's almost like two separate Leagues Cups a year, two 17-game schedules or whatever it is in MLS to get to that point. And you have these two sort of like inter-country, inter-league. I'm trying to explain it. and it's, <laughs> You know what I mean, though? Like basically it's League MX, but MLS plays their 17 games. Then they come together as leagues. League MX does the same thing, and you do it twice a year. And then you have a Campeón de Campeones at the end that decides the big champion of it all. I don't know. It's confusing. It's fun. It's exhilarating. We shall see what happens. There's a lot of MLS to talk about. The only thing I know is if this were to happen, I pray that they continue to call it League's Cup just to grind the gears of all the people who are like, what is this League's Cup thing? Right. And in 20 <laughs> years when it's like the biggest thing in the sport, and you're like, League's Cup, it's all that matters. Yes. Um... The Golden Boot presented by Audi. Is Plus my ball boy shirt that I got from League's Cup 2019. Yeah, that's going to be super uh, valuable. Oh, God. Let's hang on uh, to that one. That, that's not that. That's the 401. Not as cool as you think it is. That's the 401k plan for me. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll see oh, how that works out. I'll have a it's bedroom. Bleak. I'll have an extra bedroom for you, all right? Golden Boot presented by Audi. It's a three-man race now. Wednesday night, Joseph Martinez played FC Cincinnati, and well... <laughs> When you play FC Cincinnati, who are now tied for the worst defense in MLS <laughs> history with games left to play on 74 goals allowed, you score goals. And Joseph Martinez scored two, and that brings him up to 26 goals on the year. We know Zlatan has 26 goals this season. We know Carlos Vela has 28 goals. We know that the previous high mark was 27, and all these guys are going to break that one. And now the current high mark set last year by Joseph is 31. Each has four games remaining. Each is red heart. Carlos Vela, in the games he's actually played in, because he was hurt a little bit, has 12 goals in his last 10 games. So don't go thinking that he's slowing down. When he's on the field, he scores. Zlatan has 10 goals in his last six. Joseph Martinez has scored in 15 straight games, U.S. Open Cup included, and he's got 16 goals in his last 12 MLS games. So... The previously unthinkable is here that Carlos Vela might not win the Golden Boot. 
presented by Audi. <laughs> Who will win it? You like that save? Who I'm going to take the uh, question is Carlos Vela or other. Can we say that right now? No, it's not. It's Carlos. It's you got to take a name. Well, I was going to narrow it down after that. I'm going to. No, I'm going to. It's three names. You don't have to go process of elimination. I think. Oh God, it's honest. I I don't think it's Vela. Oh. I don't think it's Vela, and the reason I don't think it's Vela is because I don't think it matters as much to him as it matters to guys like Joseph Martinez or Zlatan. I think Zlatan and Joseph want to win the golden boot. Whereas uh, Carlos Vela, it's just, he's, he's that team first guy, you know, like that's, he, he's more concerned about that rather than these individual accolades. Um, I think I, all of these guys can score in bunches is the, the thing, you know, we've seen it. We saw what Joseph did yesterday. We saw what Zlatan did over the weekend. Say a name. I think I'm Say a name. Zlatan. Whoa. Yeah. Well, you're, and I think you're right. It's icing on the cake. Yeah. For Vela because they're supporter shield winners yeah. and everything else, and MLS Cup is the goal where it is literally the cake. Yeah. For the other guys. So we have I'm, one vote for Zlatan. We I'm have, a, I'm a, after yelling at Bobby. I'm a process of elimination. I'm gonna take out Joseph. <laughs> okay. Why are you taking Joseph out? Because they've got San Jose. <laughs> then they go to NYCFC, and I don't think that those are gonna be as open games when you look at what Zlatan and Vela have. So I'm taking him out because I don't think he's going to do it. But they have, look, they have at Montreal, and then they have New England. Mm. For sure. But and New England ship goals. <laughs> understood. But those first two games, then you look at Vela. Vela plays TFC. There's a decent chance that game's 7-4 this weekend. <laughs> so that could put Vela in it alone, and then Zlatan plays Montreal at RSL, Vancouver, and at Houston in all must-win games. So I'm going to say it's between those two. I'm going to pick Zlatan. We have two for Zlatan. I think he's going to play every game. He has to score. They have to win. And with Vela being 50-50, I think there's a chance he'll play mm. less minutes over the course of these four games. Mm, Bobby, how's your <laughs> process of elimination going over there? Well, at this point, I'm just going to take the safe bet. I appreciate what you guys are doing, but me, I'm more of a play it safe kind of guy. <laughs> so I'm going to go Carlos Vela. I'm going to go Joseph Martinez, just so just to mix it up. Yeah, just so if he does so win it, which he, very, which he very well well, there's two could. people that were right. Okay, yeah. good. He very <laughs> well could, then expert. I can celebrate on this here panel. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. Uh, the Portland Timbers. I can't wait for people to be mad at us. I know. We oh, God. Pick their oh guy. God. Probably. Probably. Portland Timbers go. fans are are, are mad uh, at their team. I think right now because they're squandering this homestand. They had a ten game homestand and they began in eighth place, and they were a five hundred record. Eight games later, they're in eighth place, and they have a 500 record. They lost again. <laughs> they lost again. The New York Red Bulls came in and won 2 nothing. The Timbers have four goals scored in their last six games. Gio Savarese says, I think we need to stay calm. It's a good idea. That's he also great. says, hopefully we're able to make the playoffs. <laughs> That's not great. That's not great. <laughs> what, what, what's going on? What happened? Is I don't it the know. same thing we've talked about over and over? They just they can't create chances? At home? Because well, they went down after three minutes, which is not ideal when you don't. To Kyle Duncan, chance. which yeah. props to him. My guy. He is your guy. Yeah. I'd have Weeby to get that. hates on Kyle I don't, Duncan. I never have, chat. never once have hated on Kyle You want to go back and look at go this, search the, the chat during chat. CCL go Santos search. Laguna game? Mm. Uh, I don't remember. I can't, you can't be prosecuted on what I don't remember. More of the same, Andrew. Let's, we don't need to spend time on this. Okay. It's more of the same for the Timbers. No cohesive ideas. It's too direct. Not enough patience. Same old, same old. Same old, same old. Fine. We'll see what happens this weekend because it's Minnesota in town, and that's a so huge they game. San Jose and Seattle kind of are the three that like play all playoff games coming up down the stretch. All their games are like against another team fighting for yeah. it. Blah blah blah. So none of them are going to be easy. So it should be pretty fascinating to watch these next three weeks. And boy, if they if they don't make the playoffs, yeah, that would be huge because this is a take everything away from where they started and how well they played on the road and the fact that as you basically laid out, they just had to get points from home. On a pure talent point of view, they're one of the best teams in Major League Soccer. And they've shown that when they've gone on the road at LAFC and gotten results and gone on the road to other places and gotten big results. When you look at Valeri and Blanco and blah, 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 and then the money they invested in Fernandez, it would be, you did the whole rant about the Galaxy not making it, blah, blah, blah. It would be in that conversation. I'm just, top five. I'm so surprised when we think about where they were last year at this time. And like, they were, they, this is when they like came together and were rolling last year. And Gio had this team, mm -hmm. like after kind of struggling to get the locker room together, like he had them, they were buying into what he was selling. And to see them in this predicament right now at this time this year is very puzzling. Well, this is an important point because this time last year, remember they 
got back on track because mm-hmm. they were a counterattacking team. Then they tried to pass mm-hmm. a little bit more. They struggled. The last few games, they went back to being a counterattacking, a counterattacking team. It was almost the exact same script. Where they spent about 10 games trying to be a passing team. They failed. They reverted back. You would expect Geo to do the same thing. So that is the sense of optimism for Timbers. Uh, Canadian Championship. One nothing impact. Nacho Piatti back scoring golazos. That's got to feel good for him. He's been on the men for most of this season. I'm going to have to table this conversation, but I want to hear from Impact and Toronto fans. We will talk about this Canadian Championship second leg on Monday, and we'll also talk about whether Nacho Piatti and Michael Bradley will be or should be back for both these teams in 2020. So hit us up on that one. Congratulations to the impact on that big win. CEO Kevin Gilmore says a sporting director, by the way, will come from Europe and be announced in the next seven to 10 days. That's per Sam Stajkul, the bird dog at The Athletic. We love him. Uh, Good information from him on that one. Before we get to Suno Galati, your game of the weekend, give me like the 22nd sell here. And I'll start with the Bradley Bowl. LAFC and Toronto FC. Toronto FC trying to stay in that home game, starting to get a little bit of pressure from DC and the Red Bulls. So they want that. They're on the road against what we expect, what will be the Supporters Shield winners who haven't won in four games. When do they clinch that? Not yet. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, not yet. NYCFC still based on all the scenarios. Like LAFC could lose all their games and NYCFC could win all their games. So it takes a little bit of time there. But four straight games without a win has really slowed down that process for LAFC. So that's my game. Bobby, what's your game? I will take the LA Galaxy hosting the Montreal Impact because at this point, the Galaxy are always dramatic and fun. Either they're banging home goals or they are struggling and on the brink of not making the playoffs. And of course, Montreal losing at home Cincinnati, bouncing back and beating Toronto in Canadian Championship. A lot going on there. They hope to get the last playoff spot in the East. And maybe Zlatan gets some goals to prove these two right in the long run. Susanna. Yep. What's your game? Uh, New England at RSL. Big playoff implications for both teams. RSL trying to stay within that top four. New England just above the playoff line right now. So valuable three points at stake. And I'm going to say FC Dallas, NYCFC because I will be there. Oh. So if anyone's at the game, hit me up. I'm coming, going down for the Hall of Fame induction, which we'll talk to Suno Galati about in a moment. Um, you look at this Dallas team, it's everything I want, right? It's They play young players. Um, Lucha Gonzalez trusts them in central midfield to be their attacking nucleus. He sat Reggie Cannon midweek, so he should come back and start. Uh I, I'm interested by how he's using Barrios and how he's trying to use his speed to press up top. And then on the flip side for NYCFC, they're current, they're clearly the best team in the Eastern Conference right now. They've got a couple big games coming up. I think they play Philly and New England as well. So they're playing teams where it matters for them. So it'll be interesting to see how NYCFC tries to manage and try and go into the playoffs at peak. Because we've never seen this, right? You've got a bye. When so you got an international break and a bye. How do you hit your peak? at the right time when you go into the postseason when you've already clinched. All right, one mailbag. I just want you to read this Zlatan comparison <laughs> real quick before Hot we take. get to Suno Gulati. Uh, James, an L.A. Galaxy fan in Rockaway, says Zlatan is a loser. Ooh. He is the Russell Westbrook of MLS. Ooh. All stats, no trophies. He produces amazing stats, but his style is not conducive to winning. It says a lot that an old Sweden team made the quarterfinals of the 2018 World Cup without Zlatan, and they didn't even qualify with him in 2010 and 2014. This sport is about winning. It's not an individual sport. Interesting. Tasty. Interesting. And he's an L.A. Galaxy fan. Yeah. Let's point that oh, out. Wait, uh, yeah. I didn't From even... James, wow. L.A. Wow. Galaxy fan. Whoop, right over the top of my head on that one. One other conversation that we will definitely have on Monday in the wake of this Hall of Fame ceremony and induction down in Frisco at Toyota Stadium. Sunil Gulati and Abby Wambach in. Sunil will join us in just one second. An interview we recorded on Wednesday. Abby will be a special you can listen to on Friday on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. We will debate which current MLSers have the best shot at being inducted into the National Soccer Hall of Fame. There's some duh ones out there. Demarcus, Tim Howard, Josie, Michael Bradley. Those guys I think are for sure entrance. But what about the rest of the league? What about legends who maybe didn't do it with the U.S. national team? We want to hear from you. Who should get in or who should have a case to get in? Uh, Hit us up. 401-206-0MLS. Extra time at MLSsoccer.com. We're getting out of here now, but we're leaving you with this very, very nice present. Sunil Gulati on the history of soccer in the United States, on FIFA, on the World Cup in 94, and in 2026, and those failures in 2018 and 2022. Enjoy the interview, everybody. We will see you on Monday.
All right, it's time now for an AT&T call to the field. We're chatting with Sunil Gulati. He's been inducted into the National Soccer Hall of Fame on Saturday in Frisco. I'm sure you know the name. Senior lecturer at Columbia, member of the FIFA Council, CONCACAF Council, president of U.S. Soccer for, I believe, 12 years. Sunil, welcome to Extra Time. Thank you. Glad, glad to be with you. So let's just start with the congratulations. You're being inducted as a builder here. You'll step on stage and get that honor from Don Garber. But uh, I'm wondering, what's one moment that might stick out to you or that you'll think about or reminisce on on Saturday? Well, I mean, I don't know if there'll be one moment. Um, there's been so many, you know, ups and downs, uh, obviously more ups than downs over uh, virtually a lifetime in sport. So, you know, if you think on, on field moments, there's, you know, there's Landon's goal against Algeria. There's Abby's header on that incredible cross from Megan Rapino uh, against Brazil. Um, or Paul Caligiuri's goal in 89, um, and any number of others. And off-the-field moments as well, um, obviously, when we got the World Cup last summer, or when kind of a combination of on-field and off-field, when MLS started. Um, you know, it wasn't what happened on the field per se in terms of the result of a game, but the fact that it happened. And Winalda's goal. So there's there's a lot of great moments along the way. A lifetime, as you said. Uh, we will have Abby on the show in a special on Friday. So listen in on that one. She had so many good things to say about you, Sunil. But MLS Commissioner Don Garber is the one who will introduce you on Saturday. I wonder what that relationship with Don means to you and, and how you find that fitting that he will be the one to introduce you on that big day. Don's been a, a, a good friend and a, a colleague and a partner um, for a long time since he started Major League Soccer. Um, he called me the day he was announced. Um, I was in Mexico at the time at the Confederations Cup, if I remember correctly, in um, in ninety nine uh, or nine, I guess ninety eight. No, ninety nine. Um, and you know, it was, uh, it's been a great partnership since. Uh, well, he was running MLS and I was at U.S. Soccer. But beyond that, um, you know, beyond the partnership of trying to grow the game in the United States in every which way and being involved in committees and boards and so on, has been a great friendship. Um, family, friends. Uh, I was at his daughter's wedding and he's been, uh, you know, involved in many personal things on my side. So it's, uh, it's a natural uh, that we'd be together on, on Saturday. The purpose of the Hall of Fame is to preserve the history of this sport. You mentioned some of the moments you've been at, some of the moments you've lived through. There are some of the peaks in U.S. soccer history on the men's and women's side. What are maybe some of the things you'd want people who are newer to the game in the U.S. or new to the game in general? What are some of the things you don't want them to forget, some of the things you want them to know? You know, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's a hard one because we're talking about a continuum over many, many years. So, for example, when people look at where we are today, and they'll make a comment, whether it's about the national team or about the league or numbers of kids playing, whatever. If you're new to the game, and this is true in every walk of life, if you're new to anything, you don't fully appreciate where things were, and that's what the hall is about um, and many other things are about. So if you look at where we are compared to where we were, let's say even in 1994 uh, when we hosted the World Cup, and that's 25 years, but where we are today um, in terms of the men's league, in terms of the women's league, in terms of the national team program in general, in terms of being le world leaders on concussion management, in terms of all of those things, the environment, mini pitches that the foundation is building, virtually every area we are light years ahead of where, of where we were. Now, if you're looking at it today, um, you don't want to know, well, okay, but 20 years ago I used to walk uphill to school. You're interested in how am I getting to school today. So I, I get that part of it. But when you take a step back, um, and that's what, what Saturday and, and the Hall of Fame in general is about, making sure that we all appreciate um, what, what came before us, how we got from where we were to where we are now. And in our case, in the case of the U.S. and U.S. soccer uh, broadly, both U.S. soccer capital, uppercase S, lowercase S, the extraordinary advances in growth of the game over the last 25, 50, 100 years even. I mean, I focus on the last 25 to 35 because that's when, when I've been involved, so my starting point is different than someone else's um, in terms of the national level. But it's, it's a pretty extraordinary growth pattern. We will get to some stories and some of those moments here. Uh, but I am now a, a voter for the Hall of Fame, and I'm incredibly honored to do so. But I'm a little bit frustrated as a voter and as a fan of soccer in this country that only Abby Wambach was able to get in on the player side. I think maybe that there are some changes to the process that need to happen. What do you think about that? Do you think people are being left out that should be in? 
Yeah, I, look, I, I think we certainly can look and should look at the voting procedures. That's happened over time. Um, and I think there are certainly a number of deserving players. And I think you'll see over the next few years uh, some players both on the men's side and the women's side that will, will come in. On the men's side, um, you know, there's a few players that retired several years ago that I think will be obvious choices. On the women's side, it's, it's a little bit different because it will be some of the players that choose to retire maybe after the Women's World Cup uh, this summer, or they may choose to continue to play. So uh, those players – maybe a little bit less obvious because we're not sure who's going to continue playing. I do think that we could look at the process, um, but you've got to keep the process such that people on the playing especially are very, very deserving um, and open it up a little bit, but not go so far that it, that it maybe devalues it. So I agree with you in general that uh, I think there are certainly some players that deserve to be in the hall uh, and elected in the last year or two that, that didn't make it, that fell just short. One of the names in the hall is Alan Rothenberg, someone you know very well. He called you the single most important person in the development of soccer in this country. What does that mean to you? Is Alan right? Well, no, I, I think there's a lot of people that have been critical in, in growing the great game, whether they're people that are part of, part of it now or historically. So I appreciate the words of Alan, and, and for him to say that when – when he launched the greatest World Cup in the history uh, of, of FIFA here in the United States, when it was so important and changing overnight, actually not overnight, but over a period of time in his presidency and the vision he had in that World Cup and in so many other things in bringing Bora to, to, to the U.S., um, we won our first Women's World Cup when Alan was president. So it's a, it's, a, it's a terrific compliment, but I think the whole thing has been built by millions of people um, and not only players and administrators and referees and coaches and administrators, but fans. So I think everyone gets a piece of, of growing the game and, well, and credit for that. Let's go back to 35 years. Take us back to the 1980s when you were a volunteer. Warner Fricker's presidency, why did you volunteer? What was it like at that time? What were you doing? And how was the Federation and soccer in this country different? Well, actually, in terms of volunteering, I got involved even earlier um, at the non-national level in the in the 70s, primarily because I wanted to play. Um, my team in Cheshire, Connecticut, didn't have a team in an age group, so a friend and I started the team, and that meant everything from uniforms to cutting fields, to cutting grass on fields, to you know, driving and everything else. Got involved as a referee and very young, um, and took uh, took a C license coaching course, I guess, in 1980 or 81. When I got involved with the national level was um, in the in the early 80s. First with the regional team program in uh, uh, in the East Coast, what's now called ODP at the time, uh, the select team program. Got eventually asked to run a national camp in 1985, um, which was a bit of a disaster. <laughs> um, fields that weren't lined, sprinklers that went off, no balls. And I saw Werner Fricker, who was president. And I had gotten, I met him. I didn't really got to know him. I'd met him a few times. I saw him at a Federation AGM and said, hey, your national team program's a mess. Um, and he said to me, well, you know, send me a note, but don't go sending me a 17-page memo. Uh, I had an Apple computer at the time, Macintosh, and was a bit of a wise-ass, I guess, so I sent him a 17-page memo. <laughs> and he said, come do something about it. And so that's how I got involved, primarily through the national team program uh, in the mid-'80s. So let's even go back further, and it occurs to me that, that we maybe jumped too far forward. I'm always interested to hear people's sort of soccer origin stories, Sunil. Where does your love of the game come from? When did you start playing? What is sign of the, the – when did this flower start to bloom? Well, in different parts of it, um, you know, if it's a garden, we're different, different flowers at different parts. As a player, um, probably age six or seven because I happen to be fortunate enough – to live in, in stores, Connecticut, and the University of Connecticut and the program in, in stores, primarily because of Joe Maroney and others, was well ahead of uh, lots of other parts of the country. So there was a youth program in stores, and I started playing back then with you know guys who would go on to be All-Americans in soccer, Joe Maroney, Billy Maroney, a guy named Jimmy Lyman, who and I were, we were in second grade together. Um, and so that's where the playing part of it came. And then later the coaching and refereeing interests came up, and then probably a turning point in all of that was when I spent a semester abroad um, in, uh, in 1978 and 79 in England, and that's where maybe the international love came, um, appreciating how important the game was internationally and different cultures and all of those things. So it's, the continuum really starts when I was six or seven years old. Uh, in 
and it all peaked in 1994 for everyone in this country with the World Cup. What sticks out in your mind from that World Cup experience? What's your favorite memory from those moments? You know, there's there's so many because I went to, I don't know how many games, 19, 20, 21 games. Um, and in my World Cup uh, love really started in 86 in the Mexican World Cup. I was working with NBC as a statistician. In terms of our World Cup here, um, everything about it. I mean, we filled stadiums, which no one had expected. So there's lots of lots of memories. Some of those are of the U.S. team, obviously, and specifically. And you know, beating Colombia was an incredible result. Eric's goal against uh, Switzerland. Um, the game against Brazil, which was, you know, in my memory forever, for a negative incident when, when Tab was elbowed and, and went to the hospital. Um, a game where it was on a helicopter between Boston and, and Giant Stadium at the time. It was called Giant Stadium. We left one game early with Alan Rothberg and a couple others um, flying to, to New York for a second game. There were two games that day. And the game went into overtime in, in Boston, or not extra, injury time in Boston. Um, and we were, we were literally getting commentary from two guys in the L.A. office on cell phones telling us what was going on. I'm sure we weren't supposed to be on our cell phones in the first game. <laughs> Um, you know, the final wasn't the game that people had expected or hoped for with, with a draw this, uh, result. But, um, you know, there's so many good games. The terrific run by the Saudi player, I guess it was in Washington. Uh, the Irish fans in New York, uh, incredible. Um, so there was, there was a lot of moments. It's pretty hard to pinpoint one in 94. Big payoff in 94. I think I was an eight-year-old watching that on the rabbit ears at my grandparents' house. That was an incredible tournament for me as a soccer fan and an incredible amount of work for U.S. soccer and FIFA to pull that off. And also an incredible amount of work to make MLS a reality. You were a big part of that organization. I remember hearing Mark Abbott, I think on this show, talk about being in a closet at a law firm basically in Los Angeles and just trying to figure it out, trying to push it forward. What do you remember most vividly about those early days of building the foundation that would be Major League Soccer? You know, those were those were incredible days because we were doing two big things at once. One was getting ready to put on the World Cup and two was starting to launch the league. And so there were several of us that were involved in both those efforts. Mark was hired by the organizing committee to write the business plan and did a terrific job in doing that. And, and much of that document is, is still the basis of what MLS looks like today, obviously with a lot of changes. But you had Marla Messing and Alan Rothenberg was obviously the leader of both efforts. Uh, Mark, Ivan Gazidis, who's, who's now the CEO at Milan, um, Randy Bernstein on the commercial side. And we were trying to do a bunch of things, create something from nothing. And in a way, harder than from nothing because the, the professional game had failed in the past, so you had that legacy to try to deal with. 94 was a success, the model, the vision that Alan had in, in getting us all around a table. And the hard part, you know, people said, what was the hardest part? I said, the hardest part was trying to do everything at once. So it wasn't just get raising the money, but it was starting from scratch and raising the money, getting stadiums, getting players, coaches, logos, you name it. Um, you know, and I remember one day Mark walked into my office, and he was behind. The, he was really the principal behind the business side. He said, "Just tell me, this, the referees will be there, right? The referees will be in San Jose." I said, "Mark, don't worry about it. We got that covered." But it was every little detail from from you know literally the referees to who was televising, and we were trying to do all that at once, which is what made it the most challenging. It wasn't like a league that had been around for many years or with a stable background. And in the midst of that was the World Cup, obviously really kicked into a different gear once the World Cup was over, um, and that's that's a big part of why we started in '96 rather than '95. MLS, not the only league you've started. You were a big part of NWSL and changing its structure a little bit from what past leagues have done. What's the future for that league? Because we spoke with Abby Wambach and she said, I'm talking to every MLS owner I can about the value that it has. Where do you see the growth for NWSL? You know, listen, it, it, when we started the league and it was a, a combination of uh, individual investors and the federation participating in the midway and the Mexican and Canadian federations participating, we knew the levels of investment would be very high. Um, whether you call that investment or whether you call it losses or negative cash flow, the bottom line is more money is going into running the league, paying players and so on, that it, than is right now uh, being raised by revenues. That's an issue. That's got to change because people won't do this forever. So it's not a charitable venture that that you're going to you know win out. You're going to have win out against save the children in United Way. So it's got to be a business that makes economic sense. Now, that doesn't mean it may not 
take 10 or 15 years for it to make economic sense and to see appreciation and asset value and positive cash flow and so on. But we're not there yet, um, with the exception of Portland, which has been very successful from day one. Um, we still have teams, for the most part, that, that need cash infusions from investors or from the Federation or a com- combination of both. There's maybe one other that's now getting close. So until that's better, um, it, it's hard to talk about a lot of expansion and growth and so on. So first thing we need to do is have it be stable. And that meant not losing teams, and that the track record of that is pretty good. We obviously added a couple uh, and lost one along the way and moved one or two, and no problem with the moves. Um, so that's absolutely critical, and it can't be based on blips that are see a short-term increase in attendance after the Women's World Cup, but then it levels off. So we've had some new partners come in. We've had a change in TV partners, some attendance increases. All of that, and as, as Abby has pointed out to you, having – synergies, whether it's with an MLS team or an existing sports venture, make things a lot easier in terms of revenue, in terms of stadium use, in terms of staff. Uh, And we've got four of those right now, but we still have to find a way to get people that are clearly interested in the sport, people that are clearly interested in women's sports or women's issues coming to games. They got to vote with their feet here. And in this case, voting with their feet means not leaving, but coming to a game, voting with their eyes by watching games on TV, buying consumer goods that, that are affiliated with the Women's League, all those things need to happen in a much bigger way than they are because it's not, we're not just around the corner in terms of, you know, a couple more people and a couple more TV eyeballs. It's, it's more than that, and that's still going to take time. Tune in uh, on Friday, I believe, when we'll release that Abby Wambach interview as a special here on Extra Time. 2026 is coming faster than I think anybody will expect. I'm extremely excited for that. I still remember 18 and 22 bids and being there. But when those days come, when 2026 summer comes, what will it mean to the U.S. and and North America? How do you think that tournament will change the landscape here, professional soccer here? What will it mean as we look back maybe 10 years down the line from it? You know, I think you just hit it on the head. There's different parts of this whole process. There was, you know, let's call it the post-22 decision process, which was, you know, difficult for a long time. Then there was, what are the rules going to be? Um, and U.S. soccer played an important role, I think, in in, in having those roles and, and outlining what we expected the rules to be and how we expect them to be improved from previous. I think FIFA adjusted and worldwide adjusted on that, and the bid process was much better. Then there's the process of bidding. Then there's the process between getting the bid and uh, and and now going forward, which is really city selection over the next year and a half, two years, whatever that may be. And then there's the build-up between now and 26 of everything we can do to take advantage of the fact that we've got this landmark event coming. Then you've got the event, the 31, 32 days, whatever it will be, with 48 teams. And what I've often said is that, in a way, is the easiest part, because we know in the United States we can put on big events. We've got the infrastructure built, so we don't need to build stadiums and build highways and, and hotels and so on. The most important part will be, what does it look like the day after? And I don't mean literally the day after, but what does the landscape of the sport look like when we're done with the World Cup and can say, okay, this is what the World Cup was able to do for us. Take us to a higher level, increase the trajectory, improve the trajectory of the game, have more people engaged in it. So for the United States, it's not about nation building. It's not about about changing the size of the economy. I mean, the, you know, sporting events generally are pretty small relative to the size of a country like the U.S. has. So it's not about economic impact at a macro level. It's about how do we continue to build the soccer nation, as Don would call it, um, that, that started so many years ago and has been developed by so many people. How do we give that not a jump start but a boost? Uh, and, I, you know, whether it's rocket fuel or anything else, whatever analogy you want to use, that's really what we're talking about. One of the most fascinating parts about this bid is the three countries working together. We already see Canadian clubs in Major League Soccer. We know how that relationship works. We've got a League's Cup final happening this week between Liga MX and MLS. You work heavily with FMF, with the leadership in Liga MX. What is that relationship? What is the future relationship, do you think, between soccer in Mexico and in the United States? You know, I think, listen, we, it's not just soccer in Mexico and the United States. It's the Mexican community in the United States and the Hispanic community, more broadly speaking, and huge immigrant communities who are passionate about the game. So we've always had a great relationship with, with the Mexican Federation and, with frankly, with the Canadian Federation. Um, Mexico's been a, a, obviously an important rival for our on-field performance and slots at World Cups or hosting events and so on. In this case, the, the relationship about the World Cup started really with, with the CEO and chairman of Televisa, um, 
whose whose father had successfully uh, overseen two World Cups, and we started talking and about all the positive things that could come out of a joint World Cup. Uh, Canada and Victor Montagnani, who's now the president of CONCACAF, and I were having similar discussions. That's how this came came to fruition. So I think you're going to continue to see great cooperation between the leagues and between the teams in the leagues and between the federations. Whether that means more interplay and so on, I don't know. People can talk about uh, cross-border leagues and so on. I think that's some, some time off because the FIFA rules on it are quite clear that you can only have a cross-border play in, in leagues and teams like Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal playing when there is a absence of a league uh, in Canada at the same level. While Mexico has a very good first division, I don't think you're going to see a joint league in the, you know, that's around the corner, but you'll see continued great cooperation like you've got with the, the, the event today in Las Vegas and like you've got between the national teams and you know, cross-border exchanges and coaching and refereeing and all sorts of other things. So we kind of jumped over it here, talking about 2018 and 2022, and I remember the pit in my stomach that day, and I can't imagine the way that you or anybody else on that committee felt. But it changed FIFA, and that helped change FIFA. But I wonder what it's like to be in those rooms, what it's like to do what you do, and what sometimes seems like a wild, wild west of governance and rules and different interests. What is it like to be on kind of the front edge of changing that and also being a part of that? You know, there's a lot of mixed emotions in all of that. Um, obviously, the, the decision in December 2010 was not a good day for, for us, for any of that were involved, or for the country, for that matter. In July 4th, 1988, and then the great day last summer when we got the right to host World Cups. And I think you're right that some of the events of December 2010 led to, first, a reform process at FIFA, one that was accelerated in many ways by actions then of the Department of Justice. And the feeling within, and I wasn't in the room throughout that period, started being on the FIFA Council in 2013, a lots of ups and downs. So it, sometimes you're embarrassed to be part of it, given some of the things that went down and the indictments and the criminality that was taking place, um, and you know, to be associated with it in any way. Um, but then to be part of it as the reforms happened and be able to try to change the image of FIFA and be part of the governance reform, those were obviously very positive days. Um, there's days where it's easy to be an American in the room, and there's days where it's very hard to be an American in the room, uh, including some in the same days with, same, with different people. Uh, after the DOG, DOJ made its, uh, made its indictments public and there were arrests, uh, there was a lot of split views, and so it wasn't easy at that time, obviously, to be associated with the, with the organization. And the image cleaning um, and the change in reputation, that doesn't happen overnight. There are still lots of people that, that are negative about the institution because of what's happened, and others that see the change and are more forgiving, but that's going to take a long time to, to completely clear um, you know, some of those things that have happened. And you'll never clear all of them because some of those continue to happen. They happen every walk of life. Um, but what happened in, in 20, uh, 2015 with the, with the arrest was that was no longer a choice. Um, that was really survival of the institution. And I think the institution reacted very well at that point. You were 12 years as president of U.S. soccer. When you look back on it, what do you think the biggest success you had that people don't know about or don't talk about that often? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's, it's a, uh, again, a moment in time. I think it's looking at where we were. And it's, I don't measure it just as those 12 years because it was vice president for six years, on the board for many years, involved with the national team program for many years. So I think if you look at it from, you know, let's pick a time of 1984, uh, which was the first U.S. soccer AGM I went to, um, to now. And if you look at that 35-year period, where the sport was, and pick any 10 data points you want, um, men's national team hadn't qualified you know, until 1989 in 50 years or 40 years. Okay, we didn't qualify for the last one, but it's not all about Trinidad, both in 1989 or the more recent setback that we didn't qualify. No women's program, now a women's team that's won four World Cups. No men's program on, in a professional league uh, level. Now we've got a Division One that's growing, a Division Two that's growing, a Division Three that's started, millions of kids playing, safer environments for those kids, Certainly far more numbers in terms of referees, television, uh, the media coverage of whether it's the national team or the leagues, uh, coaching programs far beyond we were, commercial interest, 
water cooler talk. Um, social media has obviously changed. So if you look at just where the sport was and where the sport is now, it's not just me, but I think everyone that's been involved can take great pride in that. Um, so there's been plenty of successes. I think that's the way I would measure those successes. Uh, and, and failures. And, and the failures also aren't just losing a game or not qualifying for an event. There are areas where you know, I think that we could have made bigger advances and, and some that we made but that should have been earlier, and whether that's on diversity issues or on you know, being further leaders in a number of issues, um, plenty of room for improvement, but that's what, that's what the next 35 years is all about. You mentioned it, but the U.S. national team didn't qualify for the last World Cup, and currently there's question marks around the future of the men's national team program right now. Do you think this team, this group, is on the right track? Are you hopeful? Um, I'm always hopeful, and I, and I think Greg will get, um, it will show us progress and get things on track the way he'd like them to be. It's everyone is disappointed in Trinidad. Everyone's disappointed when we don't lose games, but the exception of not qualifying, which is obviously a very, very big exception, we've had moments along all along the way for the last 25 years, including when we weren't doing, we were doing well at World Cups. Think of 2002, before and after. So there's always moments where you go through rough patches, uh, including with the women's team not qualifying uh, or not winning the medal that, that we all hoped for in, in the Olympics, came back very strong. So there's going to be set w- setbacks along the way. Progress is, you know, it's not a one-way trend. You, you have some setbacks along the way, uh, and we'll continue to have some of those. But I think people need to be patient. People need to understand that you don't win every game on the field, and there's not game improvement from game to game across the board. Um, and so I'm, I'm not a patient guy, but I learned to become more patient over time and not to judge our teams or our coaches based on one or two results. It's a long period of time. Um, MLS on one or two seasons or anything else we do, because if you did that, you'd say, well, MLS dropped a couple teams you know, early in its existence. Does that mean it's not going to make it? Look where we are now. Uh, we didn't qualify for the World Cup for a long time. And then we became one of the very few countries to qualify for seven in a row, one by hosting. Missed the last one, obviously. So I think you'll continue to see growth. Um, and I would you know, challenge anyone to show me a country over the last quarter century or 35 years, if that's the, the benchmark we're using, that has made b- as much progress on the field and off the field as the U.S. has. I don't think there's one around. I tend to agree with you, Sunil. I would also uh, ask you now, based on what you said about diversity and what we can do better, I, I look at you know, maybe representation and whether it be players or coaches or administration, I think there's been a lot of people talking about why aren't there more you know, Latinx, Latin, Hispanic people in positions of power, whether it be in grassroots, whether it be in coaching, whether it be coming up through our youth national teams and the dual national fight. Do you think we need to do better? As far as representation, as far as that side of things, can we do better? Uh, the answer is, do we need to do better? The answer is yes, of course we do, uh, whether it's on gender issues and representation at leadership levels or uh, diversity, whether it comes to uh, ethnicity or anything else. So the answer is yes. I think on the playing side, you're seeing much more of that, especially in our youth national teams, um, but it, it's not continuing in, in, in leadership positions, in the coaching cycles, and so on. So can we do better? Yes. Do we have to do better? Yes. Um, will we do better? I think the answer to that is also yes. But that's going to be a sustained effort in many different ways, and, and it takes time. But, again, coming back to patience, I'm impatient on that front as well. And so if I look back, that's certainly an area where I wish we could have gotten more done uh, while I was president and, and hope we do get more done as we go forward. This is a conversation we all have every single day, which is if you could change one thing about the U.S. soccer landscape with the snap of a finger tomorrow, what would it be? You'll have a different point of view than everyone else, so we're curious what your answer to that would be. Well, you know, I used to snap my fingers a lot and say this is what I would change. That's a lot harder now, and it is something I I ask people, um, and I don't think there's a good answer to that. I think that the snap of the finger uh, would be, a shared vision of where we want the sport to go um, and people buying into that, that, you know, in order to build anything, whether it's the national team program or a world-class refereeing program or anything else, we've got to be patient. None of us wants to be patient, um, and none of us is patient. Uh, I'm certainly not. I'd love to have, you know, the, the men join the women in terms of being World Cup champions and having far more diversity. But that's a pretty important piece of all of this. So um, if I could snap my fingers, I would say time. Um, you know, and that goes along with patience. But I'd love for it to be tomorrow, um, but we're not going to win everything tomorrow. 
Speaking of time, I think it's time for us to let you go, Sunil. But I do have one soccer nerd question because I think you're in your office in Columbia, and I'm a big U.S. soccer memorabilia guy, like trolling eBay, trying to see what I can get. What's the piece that's your favorite that you have that maybe is on the mantle or on the desk or somewhere prominent for you that's just really special? Well, you know, um, it would be two different things if if you were here, maybe three. <laughs> um, so the piece... Uh, the pieces that I like most in my office are some pictures of uh, uh, of young kids, somewhere between I don't know ages five to fifteen, um, that I took in Mexico outside of the World Cup um, in 1986. Um, there's also a picture that was an SI of uh, two kids walking out with Ronaldinho um at uh, when when the Red Bulls I guess it was the Metro Stars at the time played against Barcelona uh, and they're walking out with him uh first in line and one of those kids happens to be my son um the picture that draws the most uh, notes when they were in my office either one of the jerseys that's been autographed by the national team or a picture I have in here uh, with uh, President Clinton and Nelson Mandela which the morning after we beat Algeria so that's a pretty good uh, pretty good memento as well not bad, not bad. Suna Galati, he's a senior lecturer at Columbia, a member of the FIFA Council, CONCACAF Council, U.S. Soccer Board, president for 12 years, and now a member of the National Soccer Hall of Fame. Congratulations again, Sunil. Have fun on Saturday, all right? Thanks very much. Take care.